Australia has been home to a myriad of incredible animals over the course of life on Earth, the fossil remains of which have enabled us to gain some remarkably meaningful glimpses into various different times in our planet's history. During the Pliocene and Pleistocene, a particularly intriguing organism was inhabiting this part of the world, the fearsome and fascinating predator Thylacoleo. Commonly known as the marsupial lion, Thylacoleo would have been a terrifying beast to have encountered in the past. Despite, as the name suggests, being a marsupial and therefore sharing a close relation to iconic Australian fauna such as kangaroos, koalas and wombats, Thylacoleo is a brilliant example of convergent evolution in action, displaying many aspects of anatomy that paleontologists have noticed look very similar to placental mammals such as cats, hence the other part of its name. One of the best instances of this convergence can be seen in the dentition of the marsupial lion, the teeth of the modern carnivorans, which includes groups such as the dogs, cats, bears, seals, and many others, are notable for possessing something called carnassials. These modified teeth, composed of the fourth upper premolar and the first of the lower molars in these living animals, are incredibly well suited to sharing flesh due to the way in which the paired teeth slide past each other, allowing the carnivorous mammals to very efficiently feed on meat. Well, the modern carnivorans were not the only animals to evolve this highly effective flesh-sharing adaptation, as Thylacoleo appears to have developed some incredibly terrifying carnassials too as it became a specialised meat-eater. However, this marsupial took things a bit further than the placentals, possessing massive blades on the upper and lower jaws constructed from the upper and lower third premolars, which would have been immensely effective at sharing the flesh of whatever unfortunate creatures found themselves between its jaws. These structures are actually the largest carnassials of any carnivorous mammal known, when the relative size of them compared to the overall body size of the animal is taken into consideration. The molars behind these carnassials have in turn been significantly reduced, with no flattened surfaces present where grinding down of other substances could occur, meaning this organism appears to have been highly specialised for the consumption of flesh. The incisors, too, are pretty remarkable in Thylacoleo. It still retains the condition seen in its marsupial relatives, specifically the Diprotodontians, in which it possessed only two lower incisors, but both its lower and upper incisors were quite unlike that seen in these relatives. The teeth were greatly enlarged and shaped much more like the canines of certain carnivorans, and in turn, the actual canines of Thylacoleo had disappeared in the lower jaw and were highly reduced in the upper jaw, and don't seem to have had much of a function in the processing of meat. The convergences with carnivorans, and cats in particular, doesn't stop there though. Thylacoleo had an incredibly powerful bite. In fact, relative to its size, the marsupial lion had the most powerful bite of any mammal that's ever known to have existed. Despite being relatively small animals, on average weighing just over 100 kilograms, these beasts were capable of delivering a bite just as strong as an African lion that's over double this weight. An absolutely astonishing achievement. So how were they able to do this? Well, it seems like there may have been a bit of a trade-off in Thylacoleo. Instead of having a relatively large brain for its size, as is often the case in many carnivorans, the skull of the marsupial lion appears to be adapted more for providing attachment space for massive jaw musculature. In addition to this, Thylacoleo's skull is also quite foreshortened, meaning it had a relatively short snout compared to other mammals such as canids. This means the marsupial lion had an overall snout shape much more comparable to cats and therefore this was another adaptation of its skull that enabled the beast to deliver such powerful bites, as well as another convergence with these unrelated mammals. But what was Thylacoleo doing that required such a ridiculously devastating bite force? Well, it appears as though this animal was possibly dispatching the unfortunate prey items it got its claws on by delivering fatal bites to the windpipe, spinal column and major blood vessels around the neck, with the use of its carnassials. Therefore, unlike big cats which use their bites to slowly suffocate their prey, it appears Thylacoleo was much faster at killing, making this marsupial an incredibly efficient and terrifying hunter with its massive bite. The exact way in which the beast hunted down its prey and fed though, has been a bit of an interesting debate among paleontologists. In the late 19th century, not too long after the first fossils of this animal were described and named, there was even still some questioning as to whether or not Thylacoleo was actually carnivorous at all. Some researchers thought that certain similarities between the dentition of the marsupial lion and that of herbivorous members of Diprotodontia must have meant Thylacoleo fed on vegetation too, but it seems clear now that the teeth of this mammal were entirely specialised for the consumption of meat. The discovery of bite marks made by the animal on the bones of the giant Diprotodon also confirm this creature's carnivorous diet. Although it's now agreed that the marsupial lion was a carnivore, its exact methods of predation have been the subject of quite a bit of discussion. 
older research found that, based on the morphology of its scapula and pelvis, Phylacolea was not capable of moving particularly quickly, mainly just walking or trotting. This therefore led the researchers to conclude that it was a kind of ambush predator, but the morphology of these bones also caused them to reject the possibility of this beast being able to climb. Others have also pointed out that the robustness and relative weight of Phylacolea makes climbing unlikely. However, much more recent studies have found some pretty good evidence that the marsupial lion was indeed a decent climber. A fascinating paper from 2016 described preserved claw marks on various surfaces in a cave in southwestern Australia, which show that Thalacolea was actually very able to climb up these rocks. The paper explains how many of these markings are present on particularly steep surfaces, even though there were areas with more gradual inclines within the cave, showing that these animals were regularly climbing up steep gradients and were apparently very agile at doing so. Therefore, the paper argues, these creatures were still entirely capable of climbing up trees, despite being relatively quite large and having a bear-like build, something that other researchers had suggested made Thalacoleo incapable of being at all arboreal. Another very interesting thing that the paper notes is that there's a bias towards smaller Thalacoleo claw marks within the cave, suggesting that these were mostly young individuals making these traces. It's therefore been proposed that the marsupial lion likely kept its young hidden away safely in caves or dens, while the mothers went off to hunt. Such behaviour is actually seen in other marsupials, such as the living Tasmanian devil. Another paper, published in 2018, further added to the evidence that Phylacolea was actually an adept climber. This research describes the clavicles and complete tail of the marsupial, which had been unknown to science until relatively recently, and compared the skeleton to various other living Australian marsupials. What they found was that the overall combination of features involved in the control of the axial and appendicular skeleton could be most closely compared with the Tasmanian Devil, which is an animal very capable of climbing. So the paper again suggests that Thylacoleo was actually a good climber, despite earlier arguments that were made against this. Another interesting bit of inferred behaviour that has been determined from the marsupial lion's bones is what it was using its tail for. Looking at the shape of the chevrons, bones on the undersides of the tail, it was seen that the keels were not well developed, like the condition in the Tasmanian Devil, seeming to indicate that Thylacoleo had a similarly short, robust tail. It's therefore been suggested that the tail of the marsupial lion may have served as a stable support to allow the animal to lift its forelimbs off the ground as it processed food or raised its body to climb, once again making the living Tasmanian Devil, which does exactly this, a good analogue for certain aspects of the lion's behaviour. This also seems to be consistent with a paper published in 2016, which investigated the forearm mobility of Thalacoleo by comparing it to various different living animals, finding that the marsupial lion had a greater mobility than terrestrial mammals, but slightly less than fully arboreal mammals. The researchers proposed that this shows Thalacoleo was primarily terrestrial but had some climbing abilities, and probably relied on its forelimbs for manipulating prey much more than living placental lions do. Considering this ancient marsupial also possessed huge, retractable claws on their pseudo-opposable thumbs, it appears possible these structures were employed to some extent in dispatching prey, as well as potentially aiding them while they climbed. Their hind feet, too, also appear very well suited to climbing, adding yet more morphological evidence for this behaviour. The evolution of this terrifying beast is a fascinating aspect to investigate as well, and its relationships to other marsupials is something that has likewise been debated in the past. Thylacoleo is a member of the family Thylacoleonidae, which includes a few other related genera, some of which contain several different species. The Thylacoleonids had previously been considered to be a part of the possum group Phalangeroidea, due to the overall similarities between their morphologies that many researchers noted, however in more recent years this relationship has been shifted. More specific anatomical similarities in the skulls of the Thylacoleonids and the Vombatiformes were later recognised, and as such the marsupial lions are now placed within this clade instead, as potential stem members of the wombat lineage. Paleontologists have pointed out that this is actually quite an unusual situation, as it means the marsupial lions originated from an ancestral herbivorous group that then relatively recently made the switch to carnivory. So what other animals are included within this marsupial lion family? Well, in addition to the genus Thylacoleo, there's also Wacoleo, Lacaneleo, and the recently described Microleo. Wacoleo, originally named in 1974, currently contains five different recognised species, while both Lacaneleo and Microleo currently only contain a single species each. Thylacoleo itself actually includes three different species, the one we've mainly been talking about so far is Thylacoleo carnifex, the type species and best known of the taxa but there's also the older and smaller Thalacoleo hilli and Thalacoleo crassidentatus. 
A brilliant and fascinating insight that we are sometimes incredibly lucky to have with extinct organisms that overlapped in time with humans is the remarkable artistic depictions of these ancient animals that are found preserved for thousands of years on rock surfaces. Such records are always an invaluable means of seeing what a long dead creature looked like in life, and amazingly there may actually be some potential rock art of Thylacoleo. This rock art is still contested by some though, as it's possible that the animals shown in these depictions might instead be a thylacine, which also possessed stripes like these along their backs. However, several paleontologists who have worked on the marsupial lion do indeed agree that this rock art looks very much like it could be illustrating Thylacoleo, which of course has some fascinating implications. The first piece of rock art to be noticed as maybe showing the lion was found in 2008, from the Kimberley in Western Australia. If this really is art of Thylacoleo, it indicates a few things about its life appearance. For example, an apparent tufted tip to its tail, a striped back like a thylacine, and notably pointed ears. Then in 2009, a second possible Thylacoleo illustration was uncovered from the Kimberley as well. This one shows a very exciting scene of what some have interpreted as being a hunter possibly spearing or attempting to fend off a big-bodied striped creature. Due to the robustness of the animal depicted here, researchers examining this art have suggested it's much more likely for this to be a thylacoleo instead of a thylacine, although the massive size of the animal compared to the person may just be the result of more focus being put on this creature in the art rather than an accurate record of its relative size. Therefore, if this is Thylacoleo, the clear link between this creature and the human shows that conflicts between the indigenous inhabitants of Australia and marsupial lions did indeed occur during the time in which they coexisted. This idea of conflict with humans has, of course, also been brought into consideration when the extinction of Thylacoleo has been discussed. The extinction of Australian megafauna as a whole is an intensely debated and controversial subject anyway and research into the exact causes for the disappearance of many of these prehistoric animals is still very much ongoing. Thylacoleo has been assumed to have died out about 46,000 years ago, around the time that a lot of Australian megafauna was thought to have been going extinct. However, the dates of extinction for these animals is still disagreed upon by researchers, with some studies finding that they all disappeared within a relatively short time of each other and implicating the spread of humans as the cause, while others find that most megafauna had died out before the arrival of humans, and only a few of them actually coexisted with people, instead pointing to climate change as the cause. Still more studies have also found that humans coexisted with megafauna in Australia for a significantly long time, making it unlikely that they then had anything to do with their extinction. The entire debate over this is something I could make a whole video out of, and maybe I will, but there doesn't seem to be a clear consensus at the moment as to the precise cause of death for these animals, Thylacoleo included, and research into the problem continues. Whatever the cause, whether it was due to humans hunting the large herbivores they preyed on and changing the landscape through burning vegetation, or due to a changing climate that killed them off more gradually, Australia has never been the same since the loss of the marsupial lion. After Thylacoleo vanished, there would be no more mammalian top predators to fill in the vacant niche left by these animals. Even the thylacine, which became the largest known marsupial predator after the lion's extinction, was still occupying a different niche and was no ecological substitute for this beast. Much later on, of course, dingoes would arrive in Australia, and then foxes and cats would be brought there too, but none of these have been quite capable of replacing Thylacoleo. The carnivorous mammalian fauna of modern day Australia is therefore very different to what it was like during the Pleistocene, and whether or not humans were directly responsible for the marsupial lion's extinction, we've certainly had a huge effect on the animals of this land. So that's Thylacoleo, an absolutely fascinating and fearsome prehistoric marsupial that has been the subject of a great deal of paleontological debate and discovery, this was a beast that would have been amazing to witness in life. Its anatomy, lifestyle, and extinction are all incredibly intriguing aspects of this organism, and I'm sure future research will reveal even more remarkable things about this wonderful animal. Now, as you may have noticed, the uploads on this channel have been a little bit rarer than usual recently, and I'd like to apologise for that. Doug and I have both started at university, and so we've been having to deal with a lot more work than before. We've still been managing to keep up with the weekly 7 Days of Science series though, and hopefully I should be able to start getting some more of these sorts of videos done soon, but it's very likely that for a while the upload schedule might be a bit all over the place. We do also have some exciting ideas for much bigger projects that we're working on as well, which I'm sure you'll enjoy, but yeah, the Sunday videos will probably not be appearing quite as often for a little while. I hope you can understand. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters too, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Jan Owen, Corey Peterson, Greg Silvernail, Aphid Kirby, Christian Flores, George Vojtek, Persian Boy, 
Mike Pace, Mayer's World, Dhruv Srivastava, Matthias Bergscher, Amanda von Nordek, Just F. Max, Laura Sanborn, Mark Fawn, Dominic Baffy, and Harry Evert. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.